It lowers cholesterol, protecting you from heart attacks. It, um, the kind of soluble fiber that we're talking about that lowers cholesterol is found in brown rice and oats and buckwheat and millet, uh, in, in the whole grains and uh, in legumes. Now, the insoluble fiber does not swell up in water when you cook it. That's the kind found perhaps in celery. It cleans your colon and prevents constipation. It feels, fills you full without making any calories. And that is what makes fiber the weight loss wonder, as we already spoke about. But remember, there's no fiber in animal products. Animal foods lack fiber. They never had it. They never will. No fiber in the dairy products. No fiber in yogurt or cheese. There is no fiber in meat, chicken, turkey, or fish. There's no fiber in vegetable oils because an oil is a fat removed from its fiber. Oil is part of a vegan diet, but not part of a whole foods, plant-based, no oil diet. And so, if we eat whole, unprocessed plants, the less fiber, uh, if we eat whole unprocessed plants, we do better. And if we don't, then we have less fiber. And the less fiber in the diet, the more estrogen and the less testosterone. And you might think, well, okay, if you're a man, you might think, well, I'm not going to get excessive levels of estrogen inside my body. But the estrogen that I'm talking about is not the kind that comes in a pill, a shot, a patch. The estrogen level that I'm talking about is something that your own body makes. And it makes it even if you're a man, and it makes it if you're a woman. And so we don't want an excessive level of estrogen because that's going to suppress a man's testosterone. I'm going to show you a chemical diagram. Look at these four molecules. Estradiol is one of the many forms of estrogen. Look at the chain of carbon rings. We call that the sterol backbone. So there's a chain of carbon rings. And look at testosterone just below the estrogen. How similar they look, don't they? And look at how similar cholesterol is to estrogen. And progesterone, we call that the hormone of the mother. And so these have an interplay that when one of them is out of balance, it can suppress some of the others because the body is, uh, you know, is, they're so interchangeable in many ways in the body and they're so delicately balanced. So dietary cholesterol, the kind found in eggs, dairy, and fish, overestrogenizes a man and suppresses his testosterone levels. There was once a famous surgeon in Africa. His name is, was Dennis Burkett, and he's famous for a leukemia, a, um, I'm sorry, a lymphoma in childhood that was named after him, and that's called Burkett's lymphoma. And Dr. Burkett understood the principle that the less fiber in the diet, the more disease you have. And why is that? Because the less fiber in the diet, the more excess estrogen we build up in our bloodstream. And that causes us a lot of different problems. So why is it that the less fiber, the more estrogen? Well, according to Dr. Golden, and he's the one who published in 1994 in the journal Cancer, showing this, that the less fiber in the diet, the more estrogen in the bloodstream, and um, he explained that fiber is a sponge for the excess estrogen. It soaks it up, takes it out of the bloodstream, and carries it away. Stay tuned, and we're going to find out where it goes. You see, 24-7, the liver is like a washing machine, and it's cleaning the blood, taking out the things that it doesn't want in there. And one of those impurities that it's taking out is the excess estrogen. Now, I'm not against estrogen or females because we need some estrogen, but when it's an excessive amount, the body recognizes that that's not good and it tries to take it out. So the liver extracts the estrogen from the bloodstream and sends it down a little tube called the bile duct where it dumps it into the small intestine and it is hoping that there's enough of a sponge called fiber in the intestines from the food that we ate that will carry out the estrogen by soaking it up like a sponge and carrying it out with the solid waste. And so 
if we have enough fiber, we're gonna soak up that estrogen and out down the toilet it will go. And if there is no fiber though, then the estrogen does not get soaked up like a sponge. It does not make it to the bathroom down with the number two into the toilet. It stays in the intestine and the intestine is lined with little finger-like proje projections called villi. The villi are little finger-like projections waving in the inside of the intestine and their job is to absorb things. And so it absorbs the excess estrogen back into the bloodstream it goes, despite how hard the liver worked to take it out. And it goes back into the bloodstream and it does a lot of damage in various organs, which we're about to talk about. And this is called enterohepatic recirculation of estrogen. Entero means intestines. Hepatic means liver. This is how estrogen gets recycled instead of going down the toilet where we wanted it to go, the excess estrogen. So why is excess estrogen bad for us? The more excess estrogen, we call that a state of estrogen dominance, the more acne, the more cancer, the more blood clots, and I'm really honored that you're um, taking pictures of the slides. Thank you, do that and share them too. The more uh, hypertension, hypertension is another way of saying high blood pressure. The more testosterone deficiency, the more fibroids, which are tumors of the uterus, and cysts of the ovary and breast, which can be very painful. And the more infertility, the more excess estrogen, things get imbalanced and it's harder to produce a child. The more PMS, that's premenstrual syndrome, it has a nickname now called PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, but this is the moodiness that can sometimes happen because of the hormone changes right before a woman's monthly cycle. And one of the worst things of estrogen dominance is heavy vaginal bleeding from the uterus. And so uterine cancers are another problem of high estrogen dominance. And one of the things we didn't talk about is it causes diabetes and insulin resistance, but it also causes cancer. The more estrogen, the more cancer. That's why this is important to both men and women. So I, it's so important that I made a video about it. And no, I'm not selling anything. You can buy this if you want to. I didn't bring any um, here to this meeting. But next week, when we come to the support groups, at the Tuesday night support group, which is the Bible study support group, someone is going to win a door prize of a uh, cancer prevention and women's health um, uh, video. And if you would rather not wait until next Tuesday and you want to buy it, it's available. You can stream it or you can buy a physical copy at veggievore.com. You can rent it for less than $4. But this is, obviously, this health reboot is not about making money. But what I'm going to say tonight, there's a lot of information. So if you want it, you know, in a form that you can watch over and over, that's how you do it. Okay, now let's welcome up Pastor Michael Wolford. He serves the Pine Bluff community as a Bible-believing Christian. Pastor Wolford says that God cares about our health, including our mental, our spiritual, and our physical health. Welcome, Pastor Wolford. Thank you. Good evening. What does the Bible say about what God will do about all this suffering and disease? Well, God has an ultimate plan. And I'm so, so glad he does. God has a beautiful plan. And in the book of Revelation, page, uh, chapter 21, verse 4, you've heard this promise and it's just so sweet. We'll read it again. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former thing are passed away. Imagine a world, a coming world with no tears, with no sorrow, with no death, with no pain, with no sickness. Well, what a promise, what a beautiful promise, and may it be soon. In the meantime, we live in the valley of the shadow of death. And how then shall we live now until then? Is there hope, is there help, is there uh, some relief for the sufferings and the sicknesses and the problems that we have. Well, we'll look at that in a couple other scriptures. The scripture last night that uh, I 
was missing, even though I quoted it, was Psalm 67, verse 2. And I'm going to read it again tonight. I'm going over to Psalm 67. And there in that marvelous chapter or that marvelous song is this thought about God saving health going to all the nations. In verse 1, it says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Then it says in verse 2, that thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. God wants everybody everywhere on this planet to know that even in the valley of the shadow of death, he has help, he has hope, he even has physical help for us. David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And he said there in that Psalm, he restores my soul. And he said, yes, though I, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. I'm paraphrasing the English a little. Thou art with me. And in that verse, he said a most marvelous thing. He said, I repeat what I said a moment ago, he restores my soul. But think about this in 3 John, chapter, uh, in 3 John, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. We quoted that two nights ago. Now think about the link. In Psalm 23, the shepherd restores the soul. But in 3 John 2, it says he wants your body to also be in, to prosper and be in health even as your soul. So he restores your body even in the valley of the shadow. Now I want to think about how that happens for a moment. Go with me in your thoughts, and if you have a Bible or you have a, a phone where you can, a device where you can look at the scripture, go to Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, I'm going right to the heartbeat of that verse, of that chapter, one of the heartbeats of that song. And it says in verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. David said, I'll praise you because you made me in the womb. If you read the verses before, uh, in verse 13, it says, even in the womb, God was uh, making David, King David. And, and then it says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knows right well. Now track this, you'll find it all through the Bible, uh, because it's there, and this is the principle not only does God have guidelines and rules and laws in the Bible, but he has written on every cell of your body health laws. They're just as real as the rules and the laws in the Bible. And the Bible has health laws too. But here we find that God made the body and it's fearfully and wonderfully made. And in every cell of your body, there are laws. There's actually health laws. When we break those laws, what do you think might happen? We break down. <laughs> when we break the laws, we break down. And that's what brings sickness. So when we quit breaking those laws by the power of God and the, the, the Lord in his mercy teaching us what we're doing that's causing our problem, when we quit breaking those laws and we begin keeping those laws of health, guess what happens? Oh, it's an amazing thing. The doctors like Linda and many others all around the world find how amazing it is that often and sometimes quickly when those violations of natural law stop, those violations or the breaking of the law stops, the body can quickly restore sometimes and often does. And so when we, when we let this good news really come to us from God that he wants to have, have us be healthy. He wants to restore our body as well as our soul. And when we, when we come into harmony, when we come into to union with God and depend on his power and learn what it is that, that we're doing that's against the law of health and we start keeping it, God brings abundant health to us again, even in the valley of the shadow until we experience eternity. Thank you. All right. Really appreciate that. Let's give him a hand.
I'm very inspired that uh, Pastor Wolford has taught us that um, God wants to heal, whether he chooses to heal us in the resurrection someday in the future when he makes all things new, or to heal us now by teaching us scientific principles for changing those lifestyle habits that might be increasing our suffering. This study was published in 2015 in the Iran Journal of Public Health by Malakinejad, and he wrote that the largest source of estrogens is from what we eat and drink. Quote, estrogens are unavoidable hormones in non-vegetarian human nutrition. What he says in the study is that in the Western diet, 60 to 70 percent of animal-derived estrogens come from dairy proteins and I'm sorry, dairy products. And dairy, we're gonna talk about a little bit more why it's so heavily laden with estrogen and therefore such a factor in breast cancer and prostate cancer. Breast and prostate cancer are very similar cancers. They're just in two different genders. So let's make this easier. How is estrogen like a fire? Estrogen, that hormone that we make inside our bodies from the food that we eat and drink, is a two-edged sword. This two-edged sword has a good edge and a bad edge. A little bit of fire is a good thing, in the right place, on the stove. But too much fire, out of control, can be a disaster. And just like fire, so is estrogen. A little bit, great. But too much can cause disease because estrogen is a powerful promoter of tissue growth. Growth, 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 growth. What is growth out of control? It's cancer, isn't it? And um, this is why estrogen is a key component of mother's milk. At the time in life when um, the baby needs the mother's milk the most, it's growing the most rapidly that we ever will in our lifespan, growing rapidly in that very first year of life. And that's why mother's milk, whether the mother is a dog or a cow or a human, mother's milk is loaded with estrogen. Okay, estrogen, estrogen excess, um, when estrogen is overproduced, it can promote overgrowth. And I'm talking about bioidentical estrogen, the kind of endogenous estrogen, endo means inside, the kind we make inside our own bodies. It can promote tumor growth, whether that tumor is benign or malignant. So let's look how estrogen promotes cell growth. When is growth good? If you're a baby, growth is a great thing because babies need to grow rapidly. But overgrowth inside the body of an adult is not good. You see, excess estrogen can stimulate tumors or cysts of the breast or ovary or uterus, uh, like a fibroid tumor, and overgrowth is not good for the cells that line the inside of the uterus. Remember, endo is a prefix meaning inside, and the endometrium means the inside lining of the uterus. The estrogen thickens that endometrium and causes heavy, heavy, heavy bleeding. Excess estrogen thickens the lining of the uterus. The older a woman gets as she passes the age of 35, periods can get heavier and heavier and more frequent and last more days as she ages into her 40s. She's losing more and more blood each month. We have a word for this. It's called menometroragia, which means too much flow and too close together. And this can lead to iron deficiency anemia. Estrogen excess can cause overgrowth of the uterine lining, and that leads to a condition that doctors call dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And the less fiber, the heavier the vaginal bleeding. So let's look at a picture to see if we can see how it looks. Okay, so here we have the inside lining, that's the endometrium. Think of estrogen like lawn fertilizer. And then think of progesterone, another hormone that the ovary makes, like lawn mower. If the lawn fertilizer makes this plush blood lining build up every month, the lawn mower gets it mowed out and keeps it trimmed and nice. Estrogen increases the growth of the endometrium into a plush blood lining just in case an ovum is fertilized that month and a baby, uh, a little embryo is going to implant and grow into a baby. But if no fertilized egg happens along, the progesterone regulates the flow of blood out. So there must be a delicate balance between the level of estrogen and the level of progesterone every month. 
So, heavy vaginal bleeding. When the endometrium thickens, it's because estrogen levels are too high. How did they get to be too high? That's what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the evening. But when they're too high, they suppress progesterone levels. And so progesterone levels go too low and it can't keep things nice and trimmed and regular. So bleeding gets heavy. So how does high estrogen make low progesterone? What lowers progesterone relative to estrogen? The body fat cells produce high levels of estrogen. Every body fat cell in our body is a factory for estrogen, whether the body is a man's body or a female's body. And so the body fat cells produce high levels of estrogen and the ovaries are tasting the blood flowing by saying, hey, there's a lot of estrogen there. The ovaries get a signal, hey, there's a lot of estrogen out there, you better stop producing those hormones. And so the ovaries suppress production of estrogen. But here's the problem. The ovary makes progesterone and estrogen and it shuts off production of both. Not completely, but it suppresses them down so that now there's um, not an excess of estrogen. It's back down to the normal from you know what we're eating and drinking, but the progesterone is low because we're not getting the progesterone from the food. High estrogen levels send a signal to the ovary, shut down hormone production, and they both stop. Because the ovaries are supposed to produce um, progesterone, this means that ovaries will not produce enough progesterone when they get the signal to dampen it down. And the higher the estrogen level, the lower the progesterone level, and the more abnormal the bleeding. So, estrogen levels too high, progesterone levels too low, Endometrial thickening creates bleeding, and this is more common in a woman after age 35 if she's eating and drinking those things that lead to high estrogen. Okay, so here we're going to see how excess estrogen can lead to anemia. That's a loss of too much blood every month. It's just going out, going out. She can't make blood from her bone marrow fast enough to replace what she's losing. And the day comes when she's so anemic, she may have a heart attack. Have some of my women patients had heart attacks from heavy vaginal bleeding? They have, because as their um, level of oxygen carrying hemoglobin gets low because she bled it all out, they don't have enough oxygen to supply the heart muscle and she has a heart attack from heavy periods. And so the doctor may say, we've got to take that uterus out of there. And so it's not that hysterectomy or re surgical removal of the uterus is the end of the world, but there are some drawbacks to it. Intimacy is less pleasurable. You don't have a uterus and so orgasms are never the same. Tissues are more narrowed. Uh, they're drier, more fragile, less able to accommodate. There's a lack of uterine sec secretions flowing through to cleanse the birth canal, thus she gets infections more often, and hysterectomy is expensive, painful, and there's time lost from work and family activities. And sometimes people can bleed so suddenly that they have to go to the emergency department, get admitted for blood transfusions every day for four days, blood transfusions, blood transfusions, and then the surgeon says, we have to take that uterus out because your insurance will not pay for more blood transfusions or it's not safe to give you, or we're running out of blood. What if you bleed down to such severe anemia that you could have a heart attack and yet it could have been prevented? So, we're gonna talk about all the different ways that we can get excess estrogen produced in our body. But before we do, we're gonna talk about one more bad thing that estrogen, when it's excessive, does. And that is, it can promote growth out of control. And so, what's another word for growth out of control? Estrogen is like fertilizer, so it makes things grow, promotes cell growth, and is like lawn fertilizer. Excess estrogen can promote too much growth, and overgrowth of cells out of control growth can be called what? It can be called cancer. And so estrogen is a factor in many, many cancers, even cancers that you wouldn't think of as related to estrogen. What, colon, brain, thyroid, are they related to excess estrogen levels? Keep listening. So growth out of control was studied by Dr. Russo in 2006, and he clearly established a link that the more estrogen the gr um, inside, the greater the risk of breast cancer. And he wasn't just talking about estrogen pills, patches, shots. He was talking about the estrogen that we make inside our bodies. 
So, many patients in my former practice in Texas asked me, so doctor, do I need a blood test of my estrogen level? And the answer is, it's usually not that helpful. And why is that? Because the measured level of estrogen may fall within the bell-shaped curve. So a little bit of statistics. In the USA, where almost everybody is overestrogenized because what they eat and drink, that bell-shaped curve is very broad. Estrogens could be normal from 450 to up to 900. That's a big spread. What matters is estrogen at the cellular level. And guess what? At the cellular level, we cannot measure it. Why is that? Two reasons, primarily. Estrogen is protein bound, so it's not even in the watery part of the blood. And that's the part that gets drawn out into the syringe or test tube when the venipuncturist at the lab is drawing your blood. It's also lipophilic. Lipo means fats, and phil means to love. So the estrogen is fat loving and it sticks to the cell membrane. What cell membrane? the red blood cell membrane. And so, if it's sticking to the red blood cell membrane, it's not available to be measured. So, you may be overestrogenized, and yet, your blood test results may say, oh, it's normal, it's fine, don't worry about it. And so, what about men? Every new plant-based eater who is male in my practice if he wants to test his testosterone levels, he sees a rise in his testosterone levels after three months on an oil-free, low-fat, plant-based diet of whole, unprocessed foods. That is, if he has intact testicles, because that's where the testosterone comes from, and if he avoids caffeine and alcohol. Now, who knew that sipping on alcohol or drinking caffeine can suppress a man's testosterone levels? But they do. How do they do that? By raising his estrogen levels. So let's talk about eight factors. What causes excess estrogen inside our bodies? Dairy is the number one source of estrogen in the Western diet. Dairy provides us with way too much estrogen. And why is that? Well, there are more than seven estrogen precursors, that's a building block, in cow's milk. And there are 17 units of the estrogen in the milk of a non-pregnant cow. But guess what kind of cows are milked in this country? Cows that are kept artificially inseminated and impregnated and they're pregnant, pregnant, pregnant over and over and over until instead of living her usual 16 years, the cow is milked out, burned out, she's dead at age four years. And so, Although there were 17 units uh, of estrogen in the milk of the non-pregnant cow, there's uh, about 1,000 units of estrogen in the pregnant cow, and that's the milk being sold in the grocery store. And that's before they inject the cow with RBST, a hormone that boosts milk production and raises the estrogen um, creating uh, capacity of the milk even more. So even if you're drinking organic milk, from grass-fed cows and free range and all that, it's still got way too much estrogen, but it's really got it if your milk is not organic. Okay, and all that estrogen that we get is causing rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, cancer, acne. And um, I'm gonna show you again these uh, molecules, and I want you to understand that the dietary cholesterol which is also found in milk, unless it's skim milk, gets turned into estrogen very easily by the body. And so that's another way. If you take in cholesterol, you're going to turn some of that cholesterol into excess estrogen. Where is that done in the body? It's done in the liver. Dietary cholesterol in eggs, dairy, fish, over estrus estrogenizes a man and suppresses his testosterone levels. I know I said that before, but it bears repeating. That's why a man needs a plant-based diet. So cow's milk is great for growing a 60-pound baby calf into a 600-pound yearling cow in just one year. There's a lot of protein in milk, more than we have in human milk that uh, mothers feed their babies. But it's perfect for growing a little calf into a big cow. But 
it causes overgrowth in the human. Cow's milk contains estrogen and proteins that are great for the baby cow, but not so good for human health. You can translate that, they're bad for human health. So here's a study by Dr. Holmes and Dr. Willett. Um, why is there too much estrogen? This is point number three. There was dairy and there was cholesterol. You know, when, you, when you eat dairy or when you eat cholesterol from any source, and, all, and cholesterol only comes from animal products. Plants don't make cholesterol. Uh, it's the animal products that have the cholesterol in, unless it's skim milk or egg white. But even the protein found in the animal products can overestrogenize you. If you eat too much fat, it can raise our estrogen. What, doctor, even plant-based fat, even coconut milk? Yes, it can. And we found this out in the year 2000 by, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Wearing too much body fat is point number four of how we get too much estrogen. Because remember I said that every body fat cell is a factory for producing estrogen. Wearing too much body fat raises our estrogen level. According to a 1990 study by Dr. Barbosa in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the relationship among adiposity, okay, so that's a big fancy word, adipose tissue is fat tissue, body fat cells. Adiposity is being overweight or obese. The relationship among adiposity, diet, and hormone concentrations in vegetarian and non-vegetarian postmenopausal women. That was the name of the study, if you're interested in looking it up. Fiber, though, removes estrogen. It's the estrogen sponge, according to Dr. Rose, who did this study in 1991. And like a paper towel called Bounty, fiber can be picked up by the quicker picker. Fiber is what is the quicker picker-upper picking up the uh, estrogen and sending it down into the intestine where it's hoping to get uh, absorbed out into the stool. Fiber the estrogen sponge. This was also corroborated a long time ago, 1972, by Dr. Aries. The more fiber in the diet, the more estrogen is excreted in the stool. And aren't you glad that it's not your job to test the stool of vegetarians versus non-vegetarians to see which one has more fiber, um, which has more estrogen. I'm glad that that's not my job. But it's interesting to know that the vegetarians are excreting that excess fiber, excess estrogen because of the fiber, and as a result of having the estrogen excreted, it's not inside them causing the cancer. Okay, but what if there's insufficient fiber? then there's insufficient estrogen removal. To eliminate excess estrogen, you've got to eat the fiber in the whole plant foods that are unprocessed. Dr. King studied dietary patterns from 1999 to 2008, and he analyzed these trends, and he said a Western diet lacks the fiber to bind the estrogen, so it permits reabsorption of estrogen into the bloodstream. That's when we learned that, it was in 2008. The less animal protein in our diet, the less excess estrogen inside our body and the less breast cancer, according to a study by Tantamano Bartley in 2012. There were lower rates of breast cancer among plant-based women in the Adventist Health Study 2. This was published in the journal Cancer Epidemiology in 2012. And then there's another factor that can raise our estrogen and push us towards low testosterone or hysterectomy from heavy, heavy bleeding. And that is Dr. Karen Schleip's biocycle study, which she published at the National Institutes of Health in 2012. Caffeine in our diet increases estrogen. Even the caffeine in cacao and green tea, yes, even those. High dietary fat um, raises estrogen and increases our risk of cancer. This is a study, even though I mentioned about high dietary fat being one of the eight factors, this is uh, the study that sort of um, gives you some evidence for that, and that was done in 2014 by Dr. Farvid, dietary fat related to breast cancer. A high-fat diet increased the risk for breast cancer in the Harvard Nurses Health Study 2, 18% among all women and 21% for postmenopausal women. There was an increased risk of breast cancer the higher in fat the diet was. So this is a slide you want to lift up your phone and take a picture of because this is gonna tell you all the eight different ways that you can change your lifestyle to avoid getting excess estrogen, whether you're a woman or a man. Dairy is number one. Eating too much fat is number two. 
wearing too much fat on our body creates excess estrogen. Eating cholesterol, which is only found in animal products, creates excess estrogen. A lack of fiber in our diet, excess estrogen. And so the, um, the paleo diet, the Atkins diet, these are deficient in fiber. Remember how a few nights ago I said that 90% of Americans don't even get the minimum, or minimum amount uh, that's recommended for fiber each day. Um, the feed of animals contains hormones and antibiotics, even if those animals are organic, grass-fed, free-range. And so whenever you're eating animal products, you're going to get too much estrogen from the hormones that they feed, they put into the feed, and the antibiotics, actually. Did you know that 80% of all the antibiotics produced in this country every year go into the feed of healthy animals, some of them labeled organic, because it's not illegal for the rancher to say, oh, Bessie the cow looks sick. I better give her some antibiotics just in case she's coming down with something. And why would he spend his hard-earned money to, put, to buy antibiotics and put them in the feed of his cows? Because it makes the cow produce more of what he's um, trying to get from her. Milk, in the case of the dairy cow, and of course in beef cattle, it makes them, um, antibodies make, I'm sorry, antibiotics make bodies bigger and rounder. And drinking caffeine raises estrogen levels, and drinking alcohol leads to too much estrogen also. Every sip of alcohol is suppressing a man's testosterone, <coughs> decreasing his muscular strength and his memory. Caffeine, estrogen imbalance, and breast cancer. This is a famous study by Dr. Ken Ishitani, and it's a really good study. He studied caffeine consumption and the risk of breast cancer in a large prospective cohort of women. So a cohort is a group of women. And prospective means he uh, took the ladies and studied them through the years. I mean, these studies take a long time. It was a prospective study. It was published in 2008 in the Archives of Internal Medicine. This was prospective data relating consumption of caffeine to breast cancer. And basically what he found was the more caffeine, the bigger your tumors and the more your breast cancer. So let's look at the findings. In benign breast disease, which I have abbreviated BBD, benign breast disease, there is an associated breast cancer risk and it was dose dependent. In caffeine consumption, the relative risk was 1.32. Now, if there was no risk of cancer it would have, uh, or protective, it would have been less than one, but it's, it's above one. And so if that caffeine was consumed in the form of coffee, an even stronger correlation with breast cancer. And receptor negative breast cancer, which is a worse prognosis, it was more strongly correlated with that kind. And breast tumors larger than two centimeters. And we all know that the larger the breast tumor when it's found, the worse the prognosis, the worse they do in the long run. So there was a dose dependent relationship of caffeine and cancer. Okay, now this has been a little heavy and I've got a, a little bit more to go. So I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up and raise their arms and take a stretch because I don't want you to fall asleep. <laughs> okay, take a deep breath and sit down and relax. And so remember that the BioCycle study was published in 2012 showing that caffeine is re related to excess estrogen. The less fiber in the diet, the more the breast cancer, according to Dr. Rose, who published in 1991. The less fiber in the diet, the worse the imbalance of excessive estrogen, and he correlated that excessive estrogen with the breast cancer. So, once again, the factors that promote excess estrogen, all these eight, um, dairy, eating too much fat, wearing too much fat, eating cholesterol, which is only found in animal products, lack of fiber in the diet, so in other words, not being on a whole food plant-based diet, animal feed, so eating any animal products at all, even the, um, the egg white, which has no cholesterol, or the skim milk, which has no cholesterol, drinking caffeine and alcohol. These are soy curls. Does soy turn a boy into a girl? No, it doesn't. Now, soy curls are higher in fat. They're 54% of their calories from fat. And um, all soybeans are 54% of their calories from fat, whether it's made into soy milk or uh, tofu or just eating edamame. And soy is one of the most heavily GMO products out there. Wheat, soy, and corn are very heavily GMO, genetically modified organisms. But this soy is um, by Butler Foods. And I know the Butlers personally, they're people of integrity, and the Butlers are using organic um, 
uh, soybeans that are non-GMO for sure. And they don't say, they don't label it organic, but for sure, for sure, these are non-GMO. Plant estrogen binds to the receptor, preventing uh, the real estrogen from binding to the receptor to do the damage. So what is plant estrogen? Phyto, P-H-Y-T-O, is a Greek prefix meaning plant. And so phytoestrogen is what soy has. And so that's why soy has gotten, you know, kind of the stink eye from some of the researchers. Hey, that's got estrogen. That could be bad for you. Well, this kind of estrogen is a decoy. The plant-based estrogen is a decoy. And it, when it binds to the receptor, real estrogen cannot bind and do the damage to cause the tumors and the heavy bleeding and all that stuff. So the soy is actually protective against cancer. It is high fat, so if you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to be eating tofu every day. You want to limit it. Think of it like this, and I am very grateful to Dr. Neil Barnard for giving me this illustration. Think of um, real estrogen as being a big jumbo jet approaching the airport trying to land on the runway. And the air traffic controller in the tower says, wait a minute, big jumbo jet, you don't get to land on the runway yet. A little private plane has come and just taken over and, uh, and landed on the runway. Little private plane, that's phytoestrogen or plant estrogen from the soy. Well, the big jumbo jet has to keep circling around, circling around, so it cannot land on the cell receptor and do its damage. It's just circling around where it might get filtered out by the liver and thrown away in the waste if there's enough fiber. And so as long as there is um, the soy estrogen, the plant estrogen, then the real estrogen cannot do its damage. It cannot land because soy estrogen is there on the runway taking up the space. Okay, and so Dr. Ishitani's study is worth another look and you can look at real life people who reversed breast cancer when they were told, hey, if you don't have surgery and chemotherapy and radiation, you're gonna die. And her name is Brenda and she's got a very inspiring story here in the movie, Eating You Alive. So if you'll take a picture of this slide, eatingyoualive.com, this is a wonderful movie, very worth watching. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll get inspired by the stories here. Okay, the high fat diet in the Harvard Nurses Health Study was very much in, uh, correlated with um, the uh, breast cancer, but let's talk about fertility. Caffeine intake may delay conception among fertile women. Women. These associations were observed consistently in all the countries. This study was published in 1997 in the American Journal of Epidemiology. Even a man's fertility was decreased by caffeine. Fertility and sterility was the name of the studies. It was one of the first studies to show that what men eat and drink can affect fertility. Drinking caffeine also increases risk for pregnancy loss, such as stillbirth and miscarriage. People are more likely to lose that pregnancy early on, and that study goes for whether it was the mother drinking the caffeine or the father. There's something about drinking caffeinated beverages that is associated with pregnancy loss, said Dr. Germaine Buck Lewis, who led this study at the National Institutes for Health. And the men's fertility was decreased by caffeine in a different study in which 344 couples in Texas and Michigan were included as they tried to conceive. Of the 344 pregnancies, 28 of them ended in miscarriage and 98 uh, total. So 28%, which is 98 actual people. But drinking three or more caffeinated beverages a day raised the risk of early pregnancy loss by 74%. And that held true whether the women drank before conception or afterwards while actually pregnant. And this was published at the uh, National Institutes of Health also. And then there was the caffeine and miscarriage, the life study. The NIH um, teamed up with Ohio State in Columbus and they wanted to know, are you more likely to miscarry if you and your partner drink more than two caffeinated beverages a day during the weeks leading up to conception? And yes, that they were more likely to miscarry. They were also more likely to miscarry in the first seven weeks of pregnancy if women drank more than two daily caffeinated beverages. And this study was published online in the site Fertility and Sterility. Now some of you asked me last night, hey, could you recommend to me a book 
Um, there are many great books for um, plant-based diets. And you might think, well, wait a minute, you're talking about hormones. This doesn't seem to be a hormone book. It's like a heart disease book. And this is the book that you really should get because this book has great recipes. I've read this book. I've cooked these recipes. And tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke. And this is the um, specific book for that. And this book has great recipes written by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Jr. MD of the Cleveland Clinic, whose son Rip hired me as the medical director for the Engine 2 Immersions. And this is his famous 2008 book, Preventa Rivers Heart Disease. It is a classic and in it you will see angiogram proof of cleaned out heart arteries because of changing the diet to a whole food plant-based diet. Now remember, as we near the close of our lecture, you have the freedom to choose. I'm not going to be down on you no matter what you try to eat or drink. You, um, I don't judge anybody for what they eat or drink. I'm just giving you the science so that if you want to change and outrun your genetics, this is how you do it. There's another book that I highly recommend. As an aging person, I am very much wanting to protect my brain power, my memory power. And this is a um, book of really fascinating science by Dr. Neil Barnard and great recipes. Whole plant food can be the best medicine for the brain. Okay. Okay. And um, so, what are the five most addicting foods? Well, number five on the list is dairy ice cream. Would you like to taste plant-based forms of it that would be really good for you and won't promote disease? How about cookies? That's on the menu for this coming Monday night. I hope you'll come to our um, support group. And there's chips. Would you like to know how to get chips crispy, even if they're oil-free? And chocolate. Chocolate is a very high, uh, highly addicting um, substance, and uh, there are substitutes that are not chocolate, but they're carob, and that is a legume, and it can taste really, really good if you haven't had chocolate for a couple months. And then cheese on pizza, the number one addicting thing. Have you ever tasted low-fat, plant-based cheese that is good? I have, and I'd like to teach you how to make it. So, are we doing anything self-destructive? Let's reverse those habits. Come on Monday night to the um, plant-based support group so we can share science. Now, I'm not going to be cooking in front of you because I, I don't have the facilities here to do that here in this room. And... Uh, but we're going to learn how to cook to avoid uh, excessive female bleeding, avoid pelvic pain, avoid breast pain, low testosterone, and hypertension, which we're going to be studying tomorrow night. Hypertension is high blood pressure. And of course, overweight. So I'm hoping that you'll come on Monday night where we're going to share some very practical tips for chips. Look at the chip-tastic. You can put thin, thin slices of a regular Irish potato in here and you can get those scoopy uh, shape of the chips and they can be crispy and scoop shape and great for dip and you can cook it in the microwave. It says three to four minutes but actually depends on your microwave. Um, about 77 seconds in my microwave so I guess that's a little more than a minute. And of course I'd like you to come on Tuesday night because it's one thing to know what to do but it's another thing to stick with it for the long term. To have the power to put these changes in practice and stick with it. That's really where the rubber meets the road. And that's where the Bible offers hope because the same power that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. And if you study it together, you'll have more spiritual power too. And this spiritual power can help us beat food cravings, kick alcohol, drugs, and nicotine. And we can study the Bible and we can find out why some things are going on in the world lately that are so mind-boggling. Spiritual power for victory in real life when we study the Bible together. Come let Pastor Wolford uh, help you find that spiritual health that provides the power to make changes to improve physical health. And remember that um, we're going to have door prizes and they're going to be at the Bible-based support group. And the eight secrets that I shared today to um, lower your um, level of excess estrogen are available to take home with you or to stream online so that you can avoid hysterectomies too. I also have one for diabetes. I actually have six, six different ones and um, what you eat now can protect your future. So if you've got questions, 
click on the website at healthreboot.com to enter in your questions. Um, ask our registration table. Uh, they have lap a laptop there and they can enter in your question for you if you don't have access to the internet. And you can talk to Pastor Michael Wolford and Dr. Ferdinand Samuel. They're still here uh, afterwards in the exit hallway. And as we look at what's coming up um, tomorrow night, blood pressure and heart uh, issues and stroke, on Thursday it's preventing cancer. We're gonna go more into depth of some of these studies. And Friday, depression and anxiety. Is there hope? And how does a plant-based diet relate to reversing depression and anxiety? And then on Saturday night, all those painful aches of the body and autoimmune. So I hope to see you tomorrow night, but I have a special announcement. And that is, this room is not available to us tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we need to be in the boardroom. And as you enter this building from the second street entrance, the big main entrance, the first room on your left, the first door on your left, that's the boardroom. It's got a big conference table and it's got padded seats. So you don't want to miss that. <laughs> I'm sorry that the seats are not padded in here. But I hope that you will come because tomorrow we're going to be in there and uh, bring your family so that um, even if there's a family history of heart attack and stroke, we can outrun it. I have many, many people to thank because I didn't, I'm no, I'm no researcher, I didn't come up with any of this stuff. I read their books and read their studies and there's a lot of wonderful people whose knowledge I have gl gleaned over the years and I'm just grateful that they have shared their knowledge. And I hope that you'll share the knowledge that you've learned with other people. Just be prepared that people may not be ready to hear it, so the time to share it is not when you're eating. <laughs> All right, so. Come on back tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Bring your friends and family, and thank you so much for coming. I wish you good health.